I'm going to look at the first 22 bars of the first movement of Mozart's K283 Sonata, uh, pretending that I don't know it. Of course I know it, but I'm going to pretend that I don't. I'm going to be pretending that I'm exploring it for the first time. What I'm hoping to do with this exercise is, is just to show you how you might analyse a piece of music at the keyboard. Um, this is not a practice session uh, that I would do more than once or twice. It's not even a practice session. What it is is exploration. So if you imagine that you're a conductor, uh, you've got your score. Here's a photocopy I made with a few scribbles. Um, you've got your score and you're sitting at the keyboard and you're just exploring the, the shapes and the structure and the designs that you see in the music. And a, it's a sort of stream of consciousness uh, job here that I'm, I'm after. So first thing I'm going to do is just get the obvious things out of the way. It's in G major and it's in 3-4 and it's marked Allegro. Well, no surprise there. <clears throat> so um, doing a quick scan of it, I notice that I've got a certain pattern that I can see for the first four bars where the right hand seems to have just two or three notes and then there's a rest and two notes rest, three notes rest, two notes rest. And at the time that that's happening, the left hand has got waves, um, quavers, eighth notes that are moving in a kind of flowing direction around this area of the piano. And then he kind of jumps everything up. The left hand no longer plays, plays uh, broken chords. It seems to be playing solid events. And then I see a scale that goes up and comes down and then there seems to be an ending. Um, and that ending is, uh, is at bar 16. Um, and then I kind of notice that the music that comes after that is the same as the music that we've had in, from bar five, but an octave lower. Um, and then we get the same ending as we had here, the same scale uh, with, with some sort of cadence point at the end. And then the music seems to change quite dramatically. So what I'm seeing after that from bar, uh, let's get the bar numbers right, from bar 16, we've got a lot of octaves in the left hand. In fact, the left hand is just octaves. Um, and the direction seems to be going up and then going up again. And then it's going up again. So there's kind of a sequence there, rising four notes up and a stop. Four notes up and a stop until this one where we get four notes up and then three notes down. Four notes up, three notes down. So I've got an up-down design, a kind of, um, what would you call that, a spiral kind of design that's, that's going up in the left hand with the right hand uh, joining in. Uh, in, a, in a parallel kind of way. So in, I, what I notice I've got there is the right hand is playing broken thirds, but if I just took the first note of the right hand thirds, I've got octaves between my left hand and my right hand. So that's just like a rough overview. Um, kind of important to do that. If you're not talking, it would only take you a few moments to do. Let's come back and look at it in a little bit more um, detail, phrase by phrase. So I notice that it starts out on the fifth note, the dominant note. Now, because I don't particularly want to ingrain this in my muscles uh, when I'm learning it, why do I not want to ingrain it in my muscles? Well, muscular memory is easy come, easy go. I find that it's great if you just want to play for yourself at home, but as soon as you get in front of an audience or you're stressed in any way, the muscle memory just seems to desert us. So my mission is to avoid muscle memory until after I have got a, 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 as clear as possible sketch of what it is the music's doing, what you might call an analysis. Now the analysis can be from person to person, as I've said in my blog, there is no real one way of analysing anything. Don't be put off if you haven't had uh, you know, a music degree. I have, I've been lucky to have had that. It makes it much easier for me to analyse, but I'm going to just approach it from a, I don't know, let's just have a look at it. So I'm first of all drawn to the fact that it starts on a D, which is the fifth degree of the scale. You've got to know what your tonic chord is. You've got to know what your dominant chord is. 
chords one, four, five, you know, chord six, the relative major, relative minor, some sort of harmonic knowledge is really important if you're playing a sonata, otherwise you just won't get what, what's going on and it'll take you forever to learn it. Um, intervals also very important to know what intervals are. Um, we'll, we'll come across a hemiola in a moment. You've got to, I would say, you, do you have to know what a hemiola is in order to play this piece? Possibly not, but it would be, again, very helpful if you did know what a hemiola was. It's really, instead of counting one, two, three, one, two, three, instead of two bars of three, we get three bars of two. More about that in a minute. Starting off on the fifth note, and then if I just chart the progress of that line, dips down a third, comes back up to where it started. Now, because I'm not using muscles, I can use my left hand for that, and I notice that that answering phrase dips down a third, smooth rhythm. There's my dotted rhythm, now up in this register. Ah, and there's my uh, descending, falling second. And again, notice yourself singing, you'll want to be singing. So that I notice there's a relationship between and and there's a relationship between that. So if I want to start uh, memorizing, take two hands. Do it the other way around, the left hand can start. Now, as I'm playing that uh, phrase, that first phrase, I'm noticing that there is, buried in that uh, line, three important descending notes. D, C, B. So I've got kind of three blind mics going on there. So now I, I, my mind is latched onto that as, as a kind of structure. Now I'm interested in how does he take that down to the tonic note? Because we expect in, a, in a, something in G major that starts that way, we were, we we're going to get something like that that wraps up the phrase, and indeed that is what happens. But we have to wait a fair while for that. In fact, we have to wait until the end of the phrase um, at bar 15 when we hear the A, and then bar 16, G. Now, let's have a little look at, um, I'm going to go phrase by phrase, I think. If we look at what the left hand's doing, Alberti bass, in other words, a broken chord pattern. Different chord. So what I seem to have, I've kind of broken my rule about not using fingers, uh, as in muscles. I could have played it with my right hand. I could have played it this way to explore. Left hand plays the bass note and holds it. Because I had noticed that there is a bass line. Um, and if I appreciate it as a line, it'll help me memorize it again. Starting on the G, going up to the A, Dipping down to the F sharp, and again I want to sing it, uh, winding back up on the G. So my mind is already saying, ah, the A to the F sharp. I've had up in the right hand, or up in the, the top there. So I'm kind of making a relationship between what's going on in the left hand, in and of itself, which is a turn, isn't it, around a G, and also that there is a kind of reflection that cell down there. Um, I also notice that I've got a tonic chord followed by a dominant seventh chord. It, it, don't worry about the inversion yet, there's another dominant seventh chord there following up. Actually not dominant seventh, dominant chord, tonic. So I've got tonic, dominant, dominant, tonic, which gives me the feeling of a weak bar, two strong bars, and a weak bar again. So I've got weak, strong, strong, weak. And that gives me a lovely shape for... the first phrase. Now, I'm scanning. Do I see that music again? Uh, 
No, I don't. That music doesn't appear. Obviously, it's going to appear in the recapitulation. But I notice the next phrase, what I've got is a move up to this area of the keyboard. Now, if you know what an appoggiatura is, it's going to help you a lot in appreciating that this F sharp is a wrong note. Uh, wrong note correction. It, it's a note that leans on the harmony and produces a dissonance, which is resolved, uh, in this case, immediately. Now, how does Mozart get um, up to here? Well, he has already jumped up, if you look. Here. So I'm noticing there's a thread between this. Don't hold that note down, I'm just using it as a kind of anchor for the line. So I'm noticing there's a, a line that descends from the A, G, F sharp, E, R, which hooks up to the D, which hooks up to my C, B, A, G. So I'm discovering there's a kind of descending scale. Um, that goes through the first phrase of this piece. Now, let's have a little look at what goes on after. Where, where does this come from? Well, this is obviously based on, this is obviously based on the rhythmical motif at the beginning. Dotted rhythm. But there's a certain staticness in that from the flow. He could have carried on. Don't be afraid to do that. I'm exploring the music as a composer might, or as a conductor might. Why did Mozart not carry on? Um, because he was Mozart, because he didn't want to do the same thing predictably, possibly. So he has block chords and he gives us appoggiaturas. Now, there's something new here. I've noticed my left hand has three chords in this bar, this bar being bar 13. No, sorry, bar seven. Three chords. Dominant, tonic, dominant, tonic. So there's a feeling of arriving on my tonic as well. But there's this old faithful D again in my right hand. Now here's the hemiola. One bar. One, two, one, two, one. Let's look. You may say, well, what on earth are you talking about, a hemiola? Why, is, why can't I just feel it? One, two, three, one, two. Um, I think you could, if you felt it like that, it wouldn't be a train smash, but I think you'd be missing something. Um, kind of important rhythmically here, we've got in the left hand, if you look at the left hand, one, rest, rest. That's so clearly felt as one, two. Two, one, two, one, two. Then you may say, well, what about the right hand? Why can't I feel that in three and just play the left hand in a sort of feeling of two? Um, let's look. Well, let's look at design. I've got a scale there, haven't I, um, of G major beginning on the dominant and ending on the dominant, which takes up uh, two beats. And then I've got a descending scale from C to C that also takes up two beats. Um, you're beginning to see the pattern here. So really what I've, all I've got is C, sorry, D, C, B, A, G. So if I reduce that, rather than playing what he wrote, which is... Rather than playing that, let me play a skeleton based on the designs. You see, I would memorize that um, because I want to, to know what's under, it's like having an x-ray of the, of the thing. You know what's underneath it. So then you can add your surface detail. There's your B, A, G. Um, and it's a, it's a rhythmical, it's a point of rhythmical interest. And I noticed that he does that just after having um, a bar where you've got three different chords in the bar, this bar before. And then that leads me to look, ah, what's been the harmonic rhythm before? Harmonic rhythm is merely the, the rate of harmonic change. 
the harmonic rhythm has been in whole bars. One chord, another chord, another chord, Until here, here, shots. I should have played my left hand legato, apologies. And then here, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. So there's kind of an interesting rhythmical life that I'm noticing that's going on underneath the surface that it really would, would behove me to, to have, have, have spotted um, if I want to get the best out of this piece. I'm noticing now, afterwards, I've got the same phrase as I had in bar five, but now it's in the lower octave. So, whereas here I might have a, a kind of a violin flavor, here I've got perhaps a viola flavor, and then a dramatic jump back up so I'm noticing that's a big interval. Then I might get interested in the intervals, in the sizes of the intervals. See where I'm, where I'm going with this? It's a stream of consciousness type of approach. I'm saying, okay, that's a big interval. That's a compound fourth. What's been my biggest interval before? Oh, we've had a tenth at the beginning. All close intervals. Close. Scales, obviously close. Ah, oh, here we've got broken triads. So what we've got there is basically a replica of the, of the second phrase, an octave lower. And I've already talked a little bit about this music. See what he's doing there? He's stopping on C, D. I'm, I'm starting to notice a rising pattern R. I see that there's a C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, and there's my... Ah, finally, the modulation that we've been expecting into the dominant key, D major, um, in any sonata form movement in a major key, we're going to have the second subject in the dominant key, certainly from this period of music anyway, and there it is. So there's been a falling scale I have picked up in the first part of this first subject, and then answered by uh, a rising scale in the second part. So I'm noticing symmetry, I'm noticing design, I'm noticing harmony, I'm noticing intervals, I'm noticing patterns, all of which sort of wire, is wired up in my head. It's got nothing to do yet with what my fingers have to do. Then, once I've got that clear in my mind, um, and I could have done that actually away from the piano, I quite like doing it at the piano as well as away from the piano. You know, you can you can um, see what works for you. Combination of the two uh, is often good. But I think you'll agree there that you I've got something that I can work from. Then I can start worrying about fingering. I can start organising how I'm going to phrase. Uh, you know, what pedalling I might use. Getting this scale even or shapely at least. And if there's a technical issue there, then I can start dealing with that. But only in the context of the bigger picture.